Hello everyone. A warm welcome from Foxy Medical Disorders in Pregnancy Committee to this informative webinar along with Faridabad, Ambala, Rohtak and Rewari Obstetrics and Gynax Society. This is an initiative of Bridging Bharat brought to you in association with Science Integra, TOG and Bharat Serum Vaccines. We have today a very immersive talk on aloe immunization in pregnancy by Dr. Anjana Khanna, followed by a power pack panel on pregnancy induced hypertension with Dr. Kiran Chandana, Dr. Chanchal Gupta, Dr. Nishi Gupta, Dr. Mitra Saxena, and Shweta Jain. And I, the chairperson of Foxy Medical Disorders in Pregnancy Committee, will be moderating the same. So uh, let me take a privilege to introduce our panelist and our speaker for today. Next slide. So we have Dr. Ranjana Khanna. She is, was the Vice President Foxy 2017, organizing chairperson of National Foxy BOH, the Triology Conference in 2017, organizing secretary, National Foxy Conference, Sauma, Vice President in charge, North Zone, Yuva Foxy, Lucknow, Vice President in charge, Adolescent Health Conference, Kanpur, President Allahabad Obstetrics, uh, and Gynex Society, Honorary Secretary and Treasurer of AOGS, proud recipients of many national awards, including Foxy Smith and Milan Award, Save the Girl Child in Mumbai. Next. Next slide. Dr. Kiran Chandana. She's the current president of Faridabad Obstetrics and Gynecological Society, director Chandana Medical Center Faridabad. She has a work experience of three years of residency in ESIS hospital. Plus, she is doing private practice since 1990. And her special interest is adolescent health, with many articles published JPOG and Haryana Medical Journal. Next. Dr. Shweta J, the professor in department of OPG in PGIMS Rotak. Experience of 14 years in the field of obstetrics and gynec, 30 publications in international and national journal, areas of in interest are infertility, adolescent gynec, and high-risk pregnancy. Next, Dr. Mitra Saxena. She is the director of Sri Ashwini Saxena Hospital, Rewari. Areas of interest is high-risk obstetrics, ultrasound, endoscopy, infertility, Colposcopy and contraception, that is a wide arena of interest. And she is member Foxy, founder, joint secretary, Revari Obstetrics and Gynex Society and past president of the society. And she has held position of the North Zone Coordinator of Ethics and Medical Legal Committee, State Coordinator of Cervical Cancer Screening Camp, which was done, member of GCPR, Ectopic Pregnancy of Foxy 2020. She has contributed a very competent and de dedicated organizer and has organized many live workshops and state level conference in Rewari Obstetrics on ultrasound, endoscopy, colposcopy, and medical legal issues. And she is also the North, Co North Zone Coordinator of Foxy Breast Committee. A skilled speaker and academic interest has delivered many lectures in many AICOG and has been faculty at many, many national level conferences. Welcome, Dr. Mitra Saxena. Next slide. Dr. Chanchal Gupta, a senior consultant OBGYN advanced gynac laparoscopic surgery or in the city of Faridabad, executive member of HIAGE, secretary of Faridabad Obstetrics and Gynac Society, organizing secretary of Hagecon 2018, faculty at various national conferences at Foxy and national and international levels and author of many, many publications. Dr. Nishi Gupta, she is a practicing obstetrician and gynecologist and chairperson of Women's IMA Ambala and secretary of SOGA. So welcome to all the panelists and the Bridging Bharat, the first CME of the uh, Haryana societies was done at Rotak. So we had a first CME which was done, a webinar in the Rotak Society, uh, the Revari Society we had planned and now we are with Rotak, Revari and uh, the Faridabad Society. And I remember of this beautiful Rotak, the Jhajar Revari Highway. The Rotak city is a famous 
Rivari, Rivari and Gajak, which are very, very world famous. And I'm saying this because our webinars have seen by people across corners in India, like uh, uh, Vashi OBGYN in society or a Trichy society. Many may not know these places, but what is happening because of this webinar, we have started to know the culture and the speciality of every city what we visit in nooks and corner of India, and that is Bridging Bharat. With that note, welcome everybody. And we start with the first lecture by Dr. Ranjana Khanna. Madam, I request you to do your screen, your, share your screen. Can see yes yes we can see this is how you get it open from a very good evening friends i am going to speak on a very interesting topic and that is allo immunization in pregnancy Alloimmunization was earlier known as isoimmunization. It is defined as a process by which immune antibodies are produced in an individual by the entry of an antigen of another individual of the same species which the recipient lacks. RH blood group system consists of 50 defined blood group antigens, among which five are most important. D antigen is the most immunogenic and a person lacking D antigen is RH negative. Now the incidence of RH negativity is highest in Spain. In India, it's only 5%. RH allo immunization occurs by one of the two mechanisms, after incompatible blood transfusion, after fetal maternal hemorrhage between an RH negative mother and an incompatible RH positive fetus. RH isoimmunization is due to D antigen in more than 90% of cases. Occasionally, it may be the result of other than RH group like anti kel and anti duffy FMH and RH incompatibility. The primary response that is between six weeks to six months to RH sensitization is low levels of IgM antibodies. Later on, there is IgG antibody production in the subsequent pregnancy, which can cross the placenta and damage the fetus. So here we have a picture which shows the IgM antibodies being formed. And then this is the secondary response when IgG antibodies are formed and they enter through the placenta and cause destruction to the fetus, leading to fetal anemia. The RH antibodies coat the red cells cause destruction of the fetal cells by fetal reticuloendothelial system, leading to fetal anemia, fetal hypoxia, and stimulation of erythropoietin, extramedullary red cell synthesis, leading to hepatosplenomegaly, hepatic cell failure, hypoproteinemia, increased intrahepatic pressure, portal hypertension, and then the picture of fetal hydrops. So uh, as little as 0.1 ml only of fetal blood, is sufficient for sensitization to occur. Studies have suggested that there are 30% of RH negative women, whom we call non-responders, in whom uh, they never develop RH incompatibility, even when challenged with large volumes of RH positive blood. FMH may occur during pregnancy 10% or delivery 90%. Allo immunization in pregnancy. FMH as a reason of RH isoimmunization has been documented in 6.7% in the first trimester, 13.9% in the second, and 29% in the third trimester. The development of RH antibodies depends on inborn inability to respond to RH antigenic stimulus. There is protection if there is ABO incompatibility between mother and fetus, I'll come to it later. Strength of RH antigenic stimulus volume of leaking fetal blood and immunological non-responders we just talked about in 30% of RH negative women. So why is it that if the, there is incompatibility between, ABO incompatibility between the mother and the fetus, then the risk of RH sensitization reduces. See, if a woman is born with say blood group B, then 
she always has antibodies against A and AB in her system, which are already there. For RH, ISO immunization to take place, it takes some time for the immune system to respond. So when a, a baby of say blood group A is inside a blood group B mother, so when the fetal cells leak into the maternal circulation, first of all, the anti A antibodies are going of the mother are going to destroy most of the fetal cells. So very little fetal cells will remain for RH sensitization to take place. See, the baby is RH positive and the mother is RH negative, but there's ABO incompatibility as well. So it is a sort of a boon if there is ABO incompatibility between the mother and the baby because the chances of RH sensitization are markedly reduced in these patients. Without anti-D prophylaxis, the risk of alloimmunization is 16% and with prophylaxis, the risk drops to 0.1%. Causes of FMH. We have to take the history for potentially sensitizing events like abortion, invasive procedures, abdominal pelvic trauma, APH, IUFD, multiple gestation, MRP, ectopic pregnancy, and cesarean delivery. What are the objectives of antenatal management? Number one, prevention of RH alloimmunization allo in the RH negative, unsensitized woman. Early detection and treatment of fetal anemia in the sensitized woman to deliver the baby at the appropriate time, weighing the risks of prematurity against those of intrauterine transfusion. The other aspects of history to be explored include prior blood transfusion, Irish blood type of the patient and the spouse, all previous pregnancies, their outcomes, their interventions, history of high drops, Previous administration of anti-D, mechanism of injury in cases of maternal trauma during pregnancy, presence of vaginal bleeding and prior invasive procedures. Now for screening and diagnosis, maternal blood grouping, Irish typing and Irish typing is done at the first visit. If the patient is found to be negative, do the Irish grouping of the spouse. If the partner is Irish positive, then indirect Coombs test is advised to detect the presence of anti-D antibodies. ICT if negative, ideally should be repeated every four weeks. But since the incidence of ISO immunization is less than 0.1% before 28 weeks, so just repeat the next testing at 28 weeks. But if the ICT is positive at the first visit, Serial maternal anti-D titer should be done every two to four weeks. A critical titer in ICT is one in which there is significant risk of fetal high drops, typically between 1 is to 8 to 1 is to 32. Now, what are the non-invasive means of uh, screening and diagnosing? Ultrasound detect the hydrogen and PSV and in the is the chorionic villus sampling, which is not being done now, amniocentesis and chordocentesis. Coming to the ultrasound, confirmation of gestational age, early detection of high drops, when finding one or more of the following, ascites, pleural effusion, we all know skin edema, pericardial effusion, hepatosplenomegaly also can be seen and increased placental size. Now, the most important mainstay nowadays in the management is middle cerebrally, cerebral artery Doppler velocimetry. See what happens when the baby is anemic, then most of the blood goes towards the brain. For, uh, secondly, the cardiac output of the heart also increases and the blood viscosity is much less. The blood is thinned out because of anemia. So all these factors cause a rush of blood towards the middle cerebral artery in which there is increased velocity which can be recorded by Doppler. So this is now replaced all the amniocentesis we used to do initially, which were all invasive procedures. But now we can depend wholly on middle cerebral artery Doppler. But what are the drawbacks? It can't be done before 18 weeks. Why? Because the reticuloendothelial system of the fetus is not well developed to cause hemolysis. And it is not done after 30 weeks, five weeks. Why? Because after 35 weeks of gestation, normally also the cardiac output of the fetus increases. So this velocity normally also increases. So it is very difficult to differentiate. 
So in that case, after 35 weeks, we look towards amniocentesis. And before that, it is better to manage with MCAD. The sensitivity is 100% and 12% false positive rate for anemia. So, uh, see this, just appreciate in this the increased velocity in the MCA Doppler in RH immunized women. So, uh, how do we manage the results? Unaffected, mildly affected fetus, normal MCAT, Doppler is repeated monthly, deliver at or near term after lung maturity. Low risk of IUFD. Moderately affected, that is the MCAD is between 1-1.5 multiples of median, that is mom. And that is repeated 1-2 to two weekly, deliver when the lung is mature, you may need steroids for lung maturity. Severely affected, MCAD more than 1.5 mom or the patient has frank evidence of fetal high drops. Enhance the lung maturity before delivery, but you have to explain to the attendants that there's a high risk of IUFD. Now, see, this is a small graph which is showing us that MCA Doppler velocimetry is being done. And if it is 1.5 moms and above, then fetal sampling is done. And then you can consider intra, if the hematocrit is less, consider intrauterine transfusion. If no facilities for fetal blood transfusion, then amniocentesis can be done. If the MCA is less than 1.5 moms, then monitor the MCA PSV 1 to 2 weekly. Amniocentesis is carried out from 27 to 42 weeks and the optical density of the liker is plotted against a range of wavelength from 350 to 700. So this is all plotted on the Lily's chart, which has been very popular, but it is there in the third trimester. So how do we uh, manage according to this? Lily zone 1 or Lily zone 2, the lower zone. Repeat amniocentesis every 2 to 4 weeks, deliver at or near term. Upper zone 2, then repeat amniocentesis in 7 days or fetal blood sampling. Now, if the hematocrit is less than 30, intrauterine transfusion, if the hematocrit is more than 30, repeat sampling 7 to 14 days later. If the patient is in the zone 3, that is hydroamnios and hydrox, fetal blood sampling is done and fetal hematocrit, if less than 30, we all know intrauterine transfusion. If it is more than 30, follow up with fetal blood sampling and ultrasound and deliver preferably when the lung is mature. So, this but uh, effective from 14 to 40 weeks, unlike lilies, which can only be used in the third trimester. But nowadays, we depend more on the MCAD till 35 weeks, and after that, only go towards uh, amniocentesis. Internet connection is unstable. Ordosis intents are evidence of fetal hydro. So, sound PSA, PSV more than 1.5 moms, Lily's curve in zone 2 or zone 3, 2.7% total risk of fetus. This is a picture which is showing cordosynthesis. These are all invasive procedures. So, CVS, I told you, not performed. Management RH negative women got categorized in two main groups. One is RH negative non immunized women, number two, RH negative immunized women. So, RH negative non immunized women just do the phenotype of the father. If he is RH positive, then antepartum sensitization of the antibody screening at first visit and then at 28 weeks of gestational age. If the phenotype is RH negative and the baby is RH negative, just relax, nothing to do. Antibody screening at the first visit and then at 28 weeks of gestation. If no antibodies are detected, then give the patient. Anti D at 28 weeks of gestational age, antepartum, and then after that, after delivery. And if anti D antibodies are detected, then you have to manage as an RH negative immunized woman. So, what do you do in an RH negative immunized woman? Early ultrasound to determine the gestational age is done. And then, you, uh, if the patient is immunized, then you begin serial amniocentesis or you rely on MCA Dopplers. And then uh, if the MCA Doppler crosses 1.5 mom, 
fetal blood sampling is advised by quadrosynthesis. Fetal hematocrit less than 30, assess the gestational age. If more than 35, just deliver. Less than 35, intrauterine transfusion. If fetal hematocrit is more than 30%, just keep on following up with subsequent fetal blood sampling and lung maturity is done. This is a picture which shows intrauterine transfusion. We've been talking about it. And this is in this, the blood is injected into the uh, umbilical vein. Management during delivery. Okay, if you're doing a cesarean section and she's an RH negative woman, use abdominal packs in the sides of the uterus before opening the lower segment to prevent spilled blood from the placenta to the peritoneal cavity. Let the placenta deliver spontaneously using controlled cord traction without squeezing the uterus and avoid avulsion of the cord. Vaginal delivery in RH isoimmunization. During labor, no fundal pushing in the first or second stage of labor. Withhold injection methogen after anterior shoulder delivery. Everyone knows that. Early cord clamping and no milking. Leave a long length of cord, about 15 to 20 centimeters. No uterine massage or squeezing in the third stage. Let the placenta deliver spontaneously to avoid avulsion of the cord. Protect the vaginal and perineal wounds and lacerations from being exposed to the fetal blood, which is spilled from the cord. At birth, Cord blood sample is taken to do a direct Coombs test. Infant blood group and RH typing, infant bilirubin level, infant hemoglobin and hematocrit level. If the fetus is RH negative, no further intervention. If the fetus is RH positive, determine the dose of anti-D to be administered by a four-step laboratory procedure. The four-step laboratory procedure, uh, the rosette uh, testing is done first to see whether the fetal cells are there or not. Then the Kluwer-Hurt Betke test is done to quantify the RBCs in the maternal circulation. Estimate the volume of FMH and then calculate the dose. This is the rosette test. This is the kluwer betke test. Uh, I won't go in details. To manage uh, in the sensitized RH negative women, postpartum management of the neonate. Baby, if alive, has to be admitted in the neonatal intensive care unit. Urgent exchange blood transfusion is done in moderately to severely affected neonates. Phototherapy for the mildly affected fetus. <clears throat> Prevention of RH isoimmunization. Uh, prophylaxis, postpartum prophylaxis, routine antenatal, anti-D prophylaxis. There was a click. Postpartum prophylaxis. Now the rationale is majority of women have FMH 15 ml at delivery. Dose of anti-D 300 micrograms will neutralize nearly 30 ml of whole fetal blood or 15 ml of RH positive fetal cells. However, 0.3% of women have FMH more than 15. Then you have to do the clear Betke test to determine the amount of fetal cells in the maternal circulation and hence you have to calculate the dose of the anti-D. Prophylactic, uh, prophylactic anti-D immunoglobulins. Um, they have to be given 300 micrograms anti-D as soon as possible after delivery, preferably within 72 hours. If it is missed within 10 days, can be given even up to 28 days after delivery. Routine antenatal anti-D prophylaxis. What is the rationale? Fetal anti-D antigen develops by 40 days of gestation. Hence, the risk of sensitization increases from six weeks onwards. Silent bleed can cause sensitization in one to two percent. Therefore, postpartum prophylaxis may become ineffective. However, considering the low risk of significant FMH before 28 weeks and the cost of anti-D, 300 micrograms antenatal prophylaxis is given at 28 weeks. There are two regimens, two doses, 100 micrograms at 20 and 20, 34 weeks of gestational age. That is the RCOG guidelines. Single dose, 300 micrograms, 28 to actually 30 weeks gestational age. This is the most popular regime and this is advocated by ACOG and NICE guidelines. Now, uh, there are certain special situations like in spontaneous abortion before 12 weeks, RCOG says no anti-D is required, but others differ. 
second trimester abortion 125 micrograms anti d threatened abortion in first trimester anti d is not required in second trimester 50 micrograms anti d should be repeated six weekly if there is heavy bleeding now in high data deform mole they say that if there is a complete mole anti d may not be given partial mole anti d has to be given 50 micrograms but it's very difficult sometimes to differentiate whether it's complete or partial so it's better to give than to not give ectopic pregnancy to be given to all women regardless of the management approach other antenatal events requiring prophylaxis are chorionic villus sampling amniocentesis external cephalic version obstetrical hemorrhage a minimum dose of 50 micrograms anti d is recommended up to 19 weeks plus 6 days gestational age after 20 weeks it becomes 125 micrograms anti d as the minimum dose Following bilateral tubal ligation, would you like to give anti D? This is controversial. But uh, a woman may want a new partner and desire for IVF. And in future, if major accident occurs and RH negative is not available at, as an emergency, so if you're not given, the patient can be in a problem. Recent advances. Now, you don't have to do chordosynthesis to know the fetal uh, blood group. You can do it by fetal cell-free DNA in the maternal plasma. So this is a very uh, good technique and uh, non-invasive as well, though it's expensive. Point of care test, that is rapid test for determining the RH status. A lower 50 microgram dose preparation of anti-D for use following first trimester abortions. There is a concept of partial D and weak D antigens, usually test positive, but can also form RH antibodies. So the take-home points, every woman of childbearing age should have her ABO and RH types done at the first visit. If she's RH negative, test the husband also for his RH grouping. Ensure the ICT is done at first visit. If negative, then at 28 weeks. And repeat testing is not required if ICT is negative at 28 weeks. And you just have to give appropriate antenatal prophylaxis, that is 300 micrograms after ICT testing. A single postpartum dose may be inadequate in cases of severe fetal maternal hemorrhage. Do clear her bed K test to quantify the FMH and recalculate the dose of the anti D. Thank you so much. And I'll be standing for a governing council member. So please do consider me and vote for me. Thank you so much. Any questions? And uh, you have explained so well. There are so many controversial questions which usually come after this talk are, are all covered in your talk about the tubal ligation, ectopic and other things. So very well, very nice presentation to the point. There are so many people congratulating you in the chat box and uh, all our panelists and myself. Or Also, there is a message from Dr. Latika Shukla. Very well explained, Dr. Ranjana Khanna, madam. So there are very simple questions which uh, viewers have asked. So I'll just ask you a few of them. So what is, Dr. Poonam Srivastava is asking, what is the earliest sign of hydrops uh, on ultrasound? I think scalp edema is the first sign that comes up. Yeah. Achha, another thing, Komal, I wanted to point out was that it's very essential that uh, when you are doing, a, when you're going to do anti D prophylaxis, to do an ICT before that. Because if accidentally you do ICT after anti D prophylaxis, it will come out to be a false positive. Yes, because right, you very well. And that uh, also is going in turn with the next question I'm going to ask you. Okay. In the multi gravida patient, when we don't know about the immunization status in the previous pregnancy, hmm. when should we go for ICT? In the first, can be done first, the first, visit. first visit. First visit. First, first visit, yes. First, first visit. visit. Yes. And then and if it is negative, then at 28 weeks. But if it's positive, then keep on doing it monthly. Every monthly. Yes, very well. Then uh, another question. Patient had injection anti-D at 34 weeks. She went into preterm labor and delivered within a week. No, she doesn't need another one. So post-delivery, she doesn't need it. It no, is quite no. uh, obvious. Yeah, yeah, doesn't need. Uh, and uh, there is a it's question effective. for Anjana, madam: Is it possible to get DC to get DCT positive in an ICT negative case? 
direct Coombs test positive in an ICT negative te test and to decide the post delivery anti-D, how recent should be ICT done? Any time during third trimester or just before delivery? ICT negative that 28 weeks need not be further. Yeah. But if it is then to continue to do it every monthly or maybe even after every two weeks. And uh, the ICT is negative, how can the DCT be positive? Positive. So it is not possible? No. If so the ICT is not possible, it is not possible. Yeah. And, and the ICT should be done uh, just before delivery, postpartum, at, in the third trimester. Postpartum, so we'll do the direct Coombs test. Coombs only. test. Huh. Direct Coombs test. So it, the, the last ICT should be done in the third trimester. Third trimester. Third trimester. Okay. Huh. And, and uh, antenatal prophylaxis has already been given, we assume, at 28 weeks. Yes. Because uh, if antenatal prophylaxis is given, then for around, say, uh, uh, eight weeks, Eight weeks. Eight weeks, tuck, it can become mildly positive. But it will not be the immune antibodies. It will be the antibodies that you have given, which will fade away gradually. So what about the blighted worm? There is a question also. Uh, do blighted worm patients require anti-D? In the first trimester, they say it's not needed. But actually, we all give. We if should we give the half dose anti-D. That is practical yeah. what we are giving. Yeah. But uh, actually, ideally, nowadays, if it's a blighted ovum, it should not be required. But nowadays, you know, uh, they are we don't get 50 micrograms. But in our times, like when we were doing post-graduation, we used to get 50, we used to get 100, we used to get all these uh, strains. But now it's only 30, basically, that we are getting freely. That's freely yeah. available. So what about the twin pregnancy? What should be the dose of the anti-D for a twin pregnancy? See, actually in a twin pregnancy, if you feel that the FMH is more, then it is better to resort to a uh, clear head bed kit test. And you see the, quantify the amount of red blood cells in the maternal circulation, calculate and then give the anti-D. Maybe it is more than 30, but that depends all on the amount of fetal maternal hemorrhage that has taken place. Yeah. And luckily, if the mother and the fetus are of different uh, ABO groups, then it's very good because the FMH is much less than ordinarily yes. would have been. Yes. So right. it's very nice if the mother and the fetus are not compatible with ABO blood group. I think the questions are just coming the way uh, the, the, we are just uh, knowing the repeated again and again same things are happening and you have covered so beautifully everything in the talk regarding the ectopic and also uh, tubal ligation and everything. So I think, thank you, madam. It was a real, very, very informative talk. And so many questions and queries about anti-D in our practice have been answered. So I have uh, a question, now, doctor. Uh, can I ask one question, madam? Yeah. Yes, yeah. you can, Dr. Chanchala. Uh, yeah, ma'am, I'm Dr. Chanchal Gupta from Faridabad. Ma'am, I have a question. If a patient in previous pregnancy has not been immunized, hmm. how early in this preg in the second pregnancy should we start doing her ICT levels? I told her at the first visit only. At the first visit? Itself. Yes. At the first visit, we have to do ICT. And if she comes out, there are antibodies there, then keep on and on investigating and follow up with MCA uh, Doppler, Doppler also, and then see, continuously monitor until the critical titer is achieved. Then you have to be very careful and do the fetal blood clot sampling. And if the hematocrit is less, then intrauterine transfusion. And in fact, you can just pray to God that the baby is negative this time. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Thank you. With this note, thank you very much, Rajana Khanna, madam. Now uh, we uh, have to start the very much awaited our panel discussion and we have all our panelists who we have introduced earlier waiting. So let me just scare, share my screen. to 
go from the starting bit. Okay, so fine. Uh, so now we start with the panel discussion on hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. And we know hypertension is the most common medical disorder. Almost 10% of our patients in our OPD we see with hypertension. And the panel which we are going to discuss today is a case based about some interesting cases or a day-to-day -day common cases about hypertension in pregnancy which we encounter. So we start with Dr. Kiran Chandana. This is the first case. We have a 26-year-old primary gravida who has an extremely uneventful course and is under your care. At 28 weeks of gestation, her blood pressure reading is 140, 90, 92. She doesn't have any signs of proteinuria or any other problem. She's just come to you. And uh, I can't move this. The question is, will you like to admit the patient? And if you want to admit her, what care you will give? Or if you want to advise her to be at home? So will you advise uh, salt restriction? I can't move. Like, you can answer the question. I will share again. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Hello. You can unmute the mic, madam. Hello. Yeah. Could you hear me? Ma'am, please unmute yourself. Uh, unmute your uh, mic, madam. Ma'am, unmute yourself, Dr. Kiran. I don't know why it is not. Unmute yourself. Did you get the question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. No. Now, you can hear me, ma'am? Hello? Can, Hello? can you hear me, ma'am? Yes. Hello? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Ma'am, in, in this case, this case, this case, case yeah, yeah. Yeah. hypertension, I will not I will do, I will treat this patient as a OPD patient. And I will tell the patient that she should get her BP checkup very uh, friendly. We can, we can repeat the BP checkup after, uh, say, six hours. And if the still BP is thin, uh, if it is not the or if it is slightly OCCM age, then we will not like the patient to admit, but we will like the patient to have, if there, if there is any symptoms, like if she has any headache, she has any blurring of vision, or there's some oliguria or any epigastric pain. If any symptoms, I will tell her patient, the patient about all these. She should come for the regular checkup. And uh, for as far as salt restriction is concerned, we don't advise the patient to have salt restriction or any fluid restriction. Even bed rest is not advised in this case, in, in this patient. And we will just, uh, on the OPD basis, we will. Uh, treat this patient. Okay. So, uh, would you prescribe antihypertensives to this patient? And what would be the antihypertensive of your choice? Uh, at 140, 90 degree, uh, one to, uh, 140 to 90 degree, uh, uh, mm, I will not give her antihypertensive because they are going to compromise the fetal perfusion. So, uh, th this may cause IOGR to the patient at if the BP is 150 and 100, then or above, then we will give the antihypertensive. Antihypertensive will be uh, of choice is like 100 milligram one BD, up to 1200 milligram two be, can be given. Or second choice is nifedipine. We can add the other drug also. Uh, third is methyl dopa. That can that is given 200 250 milligram TDS, which is not uh, nowadays. This is not available. Levibet is the choice these days. Yes, ma'am? So, yes. So we will, the methyl dopa anyway was a choice, but now it is not available. So we give our main yes. thing is the labetalone. Lab so that, that is a drug. So at what uh, blood pressure would you be comfortable starting an antihypertensive? If the BP is 150 by 100 or it is more, then at that moment I will advise the antihypertensives, not before that. 
What about magnesium sulfate? If this patient goes in labor, would you be comfortable giving a magnesium sulfate for the fetal indication? For fetal indication, I will give this uh, magnesium sulfate, but not for the point of hypertension or eclampsia purpose. Because if the patient is going to deliver within 24 hours, magnesium sulfate is going to uh, help her help the patient for in the cases of cerebral palsy and for neuroprotection purposes. And magnesium sulfate is given four milli, uh, four gram IV in three to five minutes. It is then it is one gram is repeated every one hour till the delivery or up to 24 hours, uh, uh, whatsoever is earlier. And it gives the neuroprotection for the baby, and in the NICU care, it is better to give. Yes. Because so for as per well, RCOG guidelines, we, up to 24 weeks to 30 weeks, we have to give magnesium sulfate for nuclear protection. In this yes. case. For nuclear protection, there is a role definitely of magnesium sulfate. Very well put by you, madam. And uh, very good answer because this case, case is we have to monitor the case properly. It is not every patient we need to start antihypertensive. The new NICE guidelines also say that there is no rationale that you restrict the salt because that is not but additive, the added salt or ex extra salt which the patient takes, that we need, definitely we need to tell them to curtain. But as such, salt restriction is not going to help in reduction of uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension. Okay, so, and antihypertensive, we are left with labetalol very well put. So with this thing about, let us go to the next case. You can just uh, go to the next case. Session, you have spoken about all this. This has been explained. Yeah. So we go to the next case, Dr. Chanchala Gupta, a 30-year-old. She's a nulli gravita, I mean, she's a prime, uh, she is interested in conception. She has come to a clinic for preconceptional counseling. She's asymptomatic, but you find that her blood pressure is 160, 100 on examination. So what would be your approach to such a patient? Hello, good evening everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Would you advise her anti-hypertensive uh, uh, therapy? How will you yeah. explain to her about the pregnancy outcome? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Pomal, for giving me this question. And first of all, I would like to correct, I am Dr. Chanchal Gupta, I am not Dr. Chanchala. Right. Okay. And regarding regarding this question, uh, regarding chronic hypertension, basically this patient is a chronic hypertensive patient. And the best management for such patients has to be preconception. So we need to advise them regarding uh, preconceptionally. First of all, we need to assess these patients in terms of severity of the disease. How controlled, well controlled her blood pressure is. Is it a labile hypertension? Does she have any associated comorbidities in terms of diabetes, in terms of hyperthyroidism or any secondary cause of her hypertension has to be ruled out. Any nephropathies are there or uh, any uh, <laughs> patient of pheochromocytoma, SLE and all those things. Third thing in this case is we have to rule out if she has a long-standing hypertension, then we need to rule out the end organ damage or the target organ damage which has been caused in such patients because of the long-standing hypertension. Once all these causes have been ruled out by her investigations through RFTs and specific investigations, and if I consider her blood pressure records have been not on the higher side, next step is, the question says, is women regarding her antihypertensive therapy. So her antihypertensive therapy, which I would like to first see what antihypertensive she had been taking before pregnancy, Anti certain antihypertensives like ACE inhibitors, which include uh, enalapril, caproprel, and diuretics, which need to be avoided in pregnancy. Uh, ACE inhibitors, as such, per se, if given in second trimester, uh, cause renal dysfunction, and which may cause uh, anuria in in the fetus and oligo oliguria in the fetus. Also, these are all class B drugs, which can which can cause maldevelopment in the fetus in terms of uh, maldevelopment of calvaria and pulmonary hypoplasia as well. So, 
so i would like to switch her from anti hypertensives which are us uh, which are safer as dr kiran mentioned uh, in the previous question which are safer in pregnancy involving like methyl dopa though it is not available then lebetalol which is a beta uh, blocker and uh, should be given in gestation so what about if the patient has now taken the anti hypertensives who has been already on other anti hypertensives not the safer ones and she get comes with a pregnancy would you advise an mtp if she was patient? not taking the safer anti hypertensive yes. right okay yes so she needs to be counseled counseled regarding if if the baby has an anomalies which can be picked up at 18 weeks itself 18 to 20 weeks so she has to be counseled regarding that the possibility of anomalies is definitely are there and if her hypertension is def- not control the possibilities of other maternal and fetal complications to be explained to her then if uh, if there are possibilities of uh, if suppose she was taking ace inhibitors and there are definitely a possi- high possibilities of congenital anomalies then definitely i would to advise her mtp with proper counseling and are there any situations in a chronic hypertensive patient you would tell the patient to avoid getting pregnant okay yeah see a uh, chronic hypertensive patient should avoid pregnancy if her blood pressures are not well controlled she is a malignant hypertension case her uh, renal functions are not good if she is into a renal failure or some uh, high renal diseases nephropathies are there disease like coarctation of aorta in such cases pregnancy should be avoided pulmonary hypertension coarctation for in these cases i would like to avoid pregnancy and the most important thing in chronic hypertension is the patient should be motivated and compliant to follow up during her whole antenatal checkup then only she should continue with the pregnancy yes very well the case is uncontrolled hypertension with a renal or coexisting any other organ yeah. problem this patients we should advise them to defer from getting pregnant and we should correct that yes. then offer and them to get pregnant so very well for the chronic one point i would also like to add is usually these patients are obese and they have other comorbidities like diabetes hyperthyroidism yes. so those things to be ruled out if they are not controlled they have diabetes with hba1c levels of around 10 then definitely i would not advise her to continue with the pregnancy so we need to keep into the other factors ready and we need yes. to work up the patient and then uh, allow her to plan pregnancy yes. so now we go to go to the third can i add can uh, i add something dr komal to this yes dr mitra yes. because this is prenatal counseling so i think it will be very sensible that we should give her an overview that what to expect during the course of pregnancy even though we control her blood pressure which is our primary aim throughout the pregnancy however she has a chance of getting into preeclampsia also so that added complication of preeclampsia uh, onto this pregnancy she is a very high risk patient So she has to be educated about that, so that you know nowadays it is not so easy to assure the patient. I mean, we would like them to be aware that despite the control of blood pressure, uh, she may uh, at later stage around twenty-eight weeks or thirty-two weeks, she has the possibility, a higher possibility, of having superimposed preeclampsia, which has its own complications. So I think right away because these days, if we do not take care of this aspect, I mean, then the patient can actually say that we were on the start of the treatment, now why has it increased? So I think that you have explained very well, Dr. Chandra. I right, very very rightly said. As with all the underlying medical disorders in pregnancy, when they come to preconceptional visit, is quite a must, which I am emphasizing. As uh, Foxy and as a chairperson, we are emphasizing the patient that please get. preconceptional checkups and if there is anything recommendations of counseling plays a very very important role because we need to prepare them because pregnancy is a journey and we can't say that a patient with a underlying medical problem will have a normal course but 
with the advances and with the technology and with the medications and whatever is available in our hands we can uh, ensure or we can be in hand in hand with them and give uh, make their motherhood journey a memorable one so that is what we are trying and very nicely put and, uh, and i would like to add and one, one more thing uh not only the medical risk factors associated the obstetrical outcome in such patients because of iatrogenic prematurity and growth restriction that should be taken in point because the financial yes. burden which the patient has if we are delivering a baby at 28 weeks or 27 weeks that has to be pre counseled in such patients so definitely this we, we have we have the obstetric uh, point is coming uh, up in the uh, further questions we don't want to go into obstetrics right now so we'll go move on to the second one more, third, one third more case. point one small point more because we are in antenatal uh, prenatal counseling so uh, now we have this anti the screening for preeclampsia so again which is done at the level of ntnb scan we do the dual marker along with that we do the yes. platelet growth rate fa uh, growth factor so that if she is a candidate for early onset preeclampsia and being a hypertensive she is has a higher chance so we will be more alert and we will be adding on eco screen and counseling according yes. to the screening report so i mean comprehensively we can do all that um, work up we will have to do even the, even the uterine or artery doppler yes. and everything which is recommended yeah. which yeah. we will be doing it for uh, hypertension so we yeah. have a trick, uh, tricky practical case scenario so we are not going more into screening i have one more panel where i am going to focusing only on screening so we can have it next time so we will talk in and out about screening all the markers everything we have it so we move on to the third case Uh, Dr. Nishik Gupta. So here is a 19-year-old primary gravid at 36 week of gestation, and she is there in your care and service. But now she has come in an altered state with a history of convulsion at home. And when she comes, the BP is 220 by 140 with a three plus protein urea. Patient is not in labor. This is a nightmare of every obstetrician. and we get this patient probably the monsoon is a season where we keep seeing such patient so what are the priorities in your care what would you do in the first 30 minutes what is your uh, main impression about it and what will be the anti convulsant and everything so what you will specifically do on seeing such a patient yeah yeah doctor nishi yeah you unmute your mic am i audible yeah yeah you audible so yeah we will keep the patient first in the left lateral position and we'll start oxygen then we'll see her vitals and her blood pressure is uh, already you have told it's too high though in a book case i don't expect un uh, reasonable high bp but at present we'll do her uh, uh, iv line A sixteen to eighteen gauze uh, cannula should be inserted to take the investigations as well as to put the fluids. Isotonic fluid should be started, and tongue, uh, well padded tongue uh, blade should be inserted to prevent the injury. Suction has to be done to prevent the aspiration pneumonia, and then we'll uh, see for the anticonvulsants. And the best anticonvulsant used today uh, these days is magnesium sulfate. and we can do it in various regimes and one bolus of 4 to 5 mg should be given in iv at 20 to 30 minutes interval in 20 to 30 minute time and then we can repeat or we can continue it iv at the rate of 1 to 2 mg per hour and then we should investigate her for her hemoglobin cbc and her platelet counts and her uh, liver function test kidney function test and her uh, coagulation profiles also electrolyte in, uh, balance also we'll have to see and as she is now in convulsion state we can do her ultrasound to see the position of the fetus and the abrupt placenta because she is having such a high bp and after giving meg self if the bp is not yet controlled then we'll have to give her anti hypertensives 
and as the BP is quite high, we would prefer her IV uh, labetalol, and it's in the dose of 500 milligram in saline, and given at the rate of 20 milligram per minute. But if the BP does not come to normal, the dose can be doubled in every 20 minutes. But we don't have to drastically reduce the BP at once because it can lead to hypertension and decrease utero-placental blood flow. So then we have to see the condition of the cervix because she's not in labor, but the ultimate treatment of eclampsia is delivery. So if she is already, uh, already having good favorable cervix, we will induce her, but if the cervix is quite unfavorable and her condition is deteriorating, we can think in terms of cesarean also. And about, you know, you have asked what is the anticonvulsant of choice is I have told you magnesium sulfate because it helps in neuroprotection of mother. It helps in neuroprotection of baby also in terms of good fetal outcome and it produces analgesia also in women and then we yes. should and what would be the uh, what could be the regime classical regime do we all you follow pichat regime or you want to give magnesium sulfate in any other form regime yeah jaspenzim is also iv continuous line i would prefer more in pichat regime we have to give 4 to 5 milligram stat then uh, we'll give 10 milligram in im in one buttock and then we'll give five milligram I am hourly, uh, four hourly in alternate buttocks. But in the span regime, we can give it continuous IV infusion, one to two gram per hour. That will be more comfortable. But so we are all following Pritchard regime. But now I just want to bring to you two important points. If you're yeah. giving an IV mag magnesium sulfate to a patient, the loading dose, and if the patient converts, in the first 15 minutes okay what will be what will what should be done actually for this patient i believe within 15 minutes we can't just reload the patient with med sulfate so we can try other dizepam or phenobarbitone also though they are not preferred but the second dose can be given after 20 minutes of first dose we can try the bolus if the interval is more than 20 minutes. Otherwise, we can try Dajipam, Valium, 5 to 10 milligrams, or Lorajipam also to try. And one, uh, we should keep in mind other conditions also. Because if the patient is refractory to Maxel, and as we told, she was not having uh, any eventful antenatal periods, the other conditions like she can be having trauma before or during scissors, and uh, there can be any intracranial hemorrhage, etc. We should get her CT scan also done to know the things better. Otherwise, you know, I have very good experience of lytic cocktail. When I was doing uh, my PG 30 years back, no such drugs were available, IV. And we used to uh, do the lytic and we were very fond of doing and our rate of maternal mortality and feature was drastically less and our professor Dr. Rukma Nani at Merit was doing a great research and uh, she was very happy with our results also and it is also a very good lytic cocktail for prevention of convulsions if they recur after magnesium sulfate. We can just have an alternative regime. <laughs> Yeah, but you know now to give the lytic cocktail is like giving all the dose and just suppressing the patient and depressing the baby. That's why I told I you. I told you in the last anti-hypertensive <laughs> with magnesium sulfate. I think lytic cocktail is something which we read in books. And yes. I, 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 at least I have done right. I but have definitely more than uh, five hundred patients in uh, my three year postgraduate. We know, had such eclamptic patients there, and we used to give daily two, three patients. I think at all, I am very. But we should not give the message to the audience that we need to follow lytic cocktail when we have initial sulfate. It is the anti-convulsant of choice. Yeah, yeah. 
just mentioning and it should be given yes yeah. it's and not it's choice it's, it's not choice i'm just mentioning the mentioning disease that was common to be we should keep yeah. in our mind adding any adding uh, phenytoin or adding if there are refractory anti convulsant is agreed yeah. but if the scissors are happening even a magnesium sulfate the half a dose at the 2 gram if you can give iv for the recurrent scissors it also is a very good alternative so recurrent scissors is a convulsion is a very important thing like you know sometimes the patient is on magnesium sulfate you have given on the magnesium sulfate uh, and then the patient is taken for section or whatever cesarean section and post delivery we see this patient classically convulsing in practical uh, thing and the, the one dose has just given the pre delivery so what we see is the half program i am preferring uh, iv continuous iv 1 to 2 mg per hour continuous iv is better option to give always a better option yeah so when we covered i think aclamsia is something which we will go but we have just uh, covered the practical uh, aclamsia patients will have lot of complications and in the yeah. further uh, questions we are going to encounter those complications too so we will just move on to the next case i would just like to uh, just one question to other panelists as well what's the role of dilantin in such cases no <laughs> dr ranjana especially ma'am actually uh, uh, dilantin or diphenyl hydantoin is a very good anti convulsant and so if a patient is gone into status eclampticus it is very safe also so those who are having recurrent uh, convulsions only eclampsia we have already given magnesium sulfate and still the patient is convulsing then there is a point in giving iv dilantin par wahan dikha hua aa raha hai na anti convulsant can be tried the way they are whichever safer in pregnancy the the uh, the role of anti convulsant should be restricted because if you have given magnesium sulfate you normally we don't need the effect of magnesium sulfate i if agree it is but dilantin is uh, is safer in pregnancy and definitely we are just planning to terminate the pregnancy we are not yes. we are not managing this patient conservatively so uh, we have all personally also used it at Uh, times when it is actually desperate, because you are also afraid of over increasing the dose of magnesium sulfate beyond the limit. Yes. So that is why, and sometimes you know the patient doesn't respond. Otherwise, majority magnesium sulfate works like magic, but sometimes one uh, okay, very very infrequently. The only anticonvulsant I have used either it is IV diazepam drip. or iv dilantin but that in our times we were very fond of using diazepam there yeah. was this regime which we were following in which we were giving uh, iv uh, diazepam every 6 hours and it used to work wonders yeah. actually wonders so uh, but that was again uh, komal would say long time that, that is depressed yeah, no, no, not long time but what happens is that when the baby comes too depressed the, yes uh, you are right with right. the uh, diazepam does not ha- i agree a bit but not much and sometimes in postpartum uh, clampsia then it's very very useful because then there's no uh, hitch about the baby being inside <laughs> and for status eclampticus we can even give her sodium pentothalamin like uh, uh, induce her with general anesthesia and do the section yeah. so we have to have all these strategies for managing yeah. uh, yes. actually depends from case to case in our times when we yeah. were doing pg there were regular inflow of uh, pre eclampsia eclampsia nowadays it's One. become so rare Why it is there? <laughs> it's we are getting there. But if you have a bad one, like uh, really, you, it can uh, take all your. So it's like a claim that is still there. I Means so much awareness we are doing it, but still the cases are there, and uh, uh, so many people just come. They may be normal and they will come with the conversion. Yeah, so yeah. We have to be prepared with all the eclampsia drills and whatever eclampsia care. We have to act fast. That is the reason the first thirty minutes are very very important. Yeah. So next case, we'll just move now. Change the slide, yeah. So coming to you, Dr. Mitra Saxena, uh, patient now a 34-year-old, gravida two, para one, living one, 
uh, at 34 weeks of gestation uh, she is coming in your antenatal clinic with a blood report everything uh, she has a blood pressure of 140 90 all the time like she is maintaining she is your patient you know she is an on uh, on a, a hypertension in pregnancy you have been giving her treatment but today her blood pressure is 150 90 she has no protein urea but she comes with a platelet count report of 50000 so what is your impression on seeing this patient what is your differential what comes into your mind and how are you going to investigate this patient and the further management you see uh, whenever we are dealing with a patient who has got high blood pressure i mean because it's already more than 140 90 and we have a low platelet counts so we are already on alert that she should not be a patient of health where there is um, a hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes and low platelet because that is a harbinger of all the complications that can happen in a patient of superimposed preeclampsia or pre uh, just preeclampsia. So in this case, al along with the low platelet counts, definitely we will like to look at the CBC and look at the LDH, we know if there is any hemolysis. We look at the liver enzymes, the uh, bilirubin, direct, indirect, uh, conjugated, unconjugated, and SGOTPT. And of course, uh, we uh, we'd like to look at the level of platelets. So this is the most important thing that we want to rule out. Another thing is that sometimes we just have isolated th th thrombocytopenia of pregnancy where there isn't any other uh, symptom, which ha also happens in the after 32 weeks. So if the blood pressure, I mean 150, 90, and it doesn't rise, there is no other thing, and the rest of the picture is normal. I mean, she doesn't have, let's keep the differential of her condition of isolated thrombocytopenia also. But yes, we are more afraid of um, address help syndrome. So basically, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Hello. Hello. Yeah, hello. Ha, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, you can speak, Dr. Mitra. Yeah. Huh. So basically, there is no therapy for health syndrome. It is a, it's, it'll be a cascade. So if the patient gets into that phase, she's going to have all the complications that we can think of. So the only way is to deliver the patient because she's 34 weeks. So... So... Hello, I, I, have, I would much. consider giving antenatal corticosteroids and then antenatal uh, implications apart from the fact that such a baby would have so the problem of um, so those complications would be there. The direct health syndrome doesn't affect the neonate. Hello. Hello, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there is a problem in the connection. The voice is cracking. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Hello. Hello, now we can hear you. Hello. Hello, yes, yes. Okay, Dr. Komal. Yes, I can hear you. So, we were Hello? discussing about the HELP syndrome. Yes. Yeah. So, basically, we would like to manage this patient, control our blood pressure, and Confirm that it is, if it is help, then definitely we have to deliver her. If it is not help, if everything is normal, only the platelets are low, then we have to wait. Because if it is isolated thrombocytopenia, then we need not be afraid. Because then the outcome will be not so bad. Yes. And uh, what would be your mode of delivery? As you are more inclined towards practical obstetrics, do yeah. you be inducing this patient and how are we going to deliver this patient? So basically we have to go with the same fact. The success of induction is going to be dependent upon
Hello. From the condition of the cervix. So, uh, every, so the uh, bishop score would not be so good. However, we have to look at the clinical picture and the clinical condition of the patient. If the um, if the enzymes are not too raised, if platelets, I mean, of course, fifty thousand is less, but uh, the rest of the blood picture and any other uh, symptoms, if she is having epigastric pain or anything which is telling us that this is compounding and the complications uh, of uh, preeclampsia are there, then we should terminate <coughs> earlier then. Uh, but if color Doppler is fine, we may, and the Bishop score is good, then we try, can try induction of labor. Otherwise, we need to do a cesarean section. And any special care during cesarean section, like what about the platelet transfusion and how, how at what level you would you recommend? No, I don't, at 50,000, I'm not expecting that we, yeah, we should be prepared. We should be prepared with the components, with the platelet uh, infusions. But if we take a timely decision with before it deteriorates, we may, I mean, that's the only thing. And uh, rest, I think everything is fine. And I'm not expecting any problem if things are taken care of earlier. But yes, if we are on, on the downside, then we can expect all the complications of DIC. Then we have to have platelet uh, transfusions ready at hand. Yeah. Yes, we will have to be prepared for the DIC and we'll have to yeah. keep everything at, at hand. And what about India, the worst? Will you give, prefer giving steroids to, to these patients? Yeah, antenatal corticosteroids, I said, I said in the very beginning, that yes, I will yes. be giving antenatal corticosteroids. I said, maybe. Yes, yeah, probably the connection was a little problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So very, yeah. very well explained about the HELP syndrome. And this is the most commonest and the most dreadful complication which we see in our, and which we are more worried about our patient because we need to tackle these patients who require operative intervention. And we, we don't have a, it increases the morbidity and even mortality in our patients. So we don't want our patients to go into health syndrome. We want to anticipate and manage them. And uh, so with this, now we move on to the next case, which is one more complication of uh, 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 hypertension in pregnancy. And Dr. Shweta Jain, uh, yes. we have here a 30-year-old primary gravida who has been now delivered by emergency LSEA. So she's post-delivery and the indication was abrupt of placenta, she came in through all the complications, what we discussed about severe preeclampsia. And after four hours of post-delivery, you see the catheter and the urine is only 20 ml. Right from the uh, immediate post-op, the catheter is not blocked, the bag has not been emptied. So what things come into your mind? What are the possible reasons of this post lacs oligoid urine? So Dr. Kormann, can you Yes, yes, you're audible. Okay. Firstly, uh, Dr. Connell, thank you for inviting me on this panel with all of you. And I want to add one more thing. Ki after coming nice guideline, we are uh, giving anti-hypertensive uh, anti agent at 140 90 also. And uh, secondly, we are adding ecosprin in every case of chronic hypertension coming in the bad weeks. Okay. And coming to this case, Dr. Komal, it appears the most common cause of oligoria in this case, foremost cause is hypovolemia. Most commonly because the case of preeclampsia with abruptio. In We know preeclampsia cases, kidney are already compromised. And after then, there is abruptio for which we have to go to caesarean section. It means abruptio is in moderate amount. That we have to go for caesarean section. So hypovolemia may be the cause. And this abrupt show, which lead to conjunctive coagulopathy, can lead to DIC. And this DIC can lead to microcirculation inhibition in this kidney. So we should keep in mind that we have to cover this hypovolemia to cover up this oligoyuria, basically. So would you, would you insert a central line? How will be your management? And what investigations will you do for that DIC in absence okay. of okay. science and symptoms, science of DIC, clinically? Basically, science. generally in cases of preeclampsia, where we are going for caesarean section for any obstetric condition, we are not putting central line. But because this is a case of uh, preeclampsia, severe preeclampsia with abruptio, we will put central line because hemodynamically unstable, in a hemodynamically unstable patient, 
you have to give the fluid in a very controlled way otherwise it will lead to pulmonary edema and secondly you have to take care of urine output also so in these cases it's better you always go for invasive monitoring ideal invasive monitoring by the pulmonary artery vas catheter but that is not possible in our setup so we are putting cv central venous pressure uh, yes in preeclampsia case in central venous pressure is not a good because that shows always a bigger amount instead of showing 2 uh, to 6 they shows up to even 8 to 10 we are putting well basically we are we should go invasive monitoring in this patient and after giving covering the hypovolemia with the help of blood products not we should not directly add we can add furosemide after firstly we should cover up with blood products as well as with the colloid solution in a specific condition then we can give furosemide 40 mg stat we are giving and after that 20 mg 8 hourly we are adding and as if dic is clear cut then we can get blood from any area but if dic is not clear cut then we will go for d dimer fibrin degradation product in this case and fibrinogen level even plasma uh, thrombin time and plasma thromboblastin time also increase but generally that is not a good marker in preeclampsia patient because in those cases during pregnancy that is decreased but fibrinogen and d dimer and fdp are a good indicator yes yes very very well covered everything all the questions about the doses of fluoroamide also the practically what uh, investigation we should do for dic and if everything is abnormal we need to correct it as per the report yeah we, we have to then correct the dic as we discussed in help syndrome and everything so this uh, happens the case of oliguria and we have lot of questions you know the uh, so many innumerable questions from our audience and uh, there are my chat box almost is so much full and the patient the, they are asking so many questions uh, there is one question Dr. Poman, uh, I Dr. Dr. can Manisha i add Gaj. something yes can i add something for what dr shweta said though it is only uh, she is suspecting hypovolemia in such patients but we should be very careful in such patients when we are giving iv fluids Yes. because it's a two way sword kind of a thing we should not overload these patients they are no no that is the reason we we discussed about the central line so yes. these are the patients yes. where you should yes. consider putting in central line central so that line. you don't overload, overload so that was put but uh, there is yeah. one question which i find little different so dr manisha garg is asking can we give intranasal midazolam anybody has used it intranasal for for eclampsia yeah, she meant no actually we are not having idea uh, per uh, maybe uh, anesthesia people sometimes adding midazolam if recurrent fits are there and they have to intubate yes. the patient they are adding them yeah they are giving iv midazolam also the intensivist yes. uh, if we are working like i am working in a corporate setup such patients are in the intensive care so we give iv midazolam not intranasal so this I is a question about intranasal midazolam so something which i haven't used because i feel magnesium sulfate our anti convulsant everything is acting so we have not gone to that only thing is the patient is under uh, if you are taking the patient is uh, for a uh, operative delivery and cesarean section and anyway the patient is sedated such patients are on midazolam yes. but intranasal is something which is a new thing okay now uh, there is a question from dr sangeeta pahawa in which cases of eclampsia are you going for conservative management dr mitra saxena can you answer this in which cases of eclampsia you are going to conservative management which which sorry cases of eclampsia you are going to do conservative probably you are not going to deliver uh, which cases of eclampsia if it is anti part of eclampsia and it settles down which we call interval eclampsia so if it's a very early uh, episode of eclampsia and remarkably the patient uh, you know settles down with our management of the convulsion the blood pressure settles because we've seen these kinds of patients somebody coming up very early at 28 weeks 26 weeks uh, convulsing but settles down and there is no fetal uh, i mean uh, the baby and the mother they are both fine and then under complete uh, you know care very very there is a strict vigilance for any complication which should be earlier than late and 
we may this was mentioned as interval eclampsia so earlier you have an episode and then it's uh, you know she's been lucky but unless i mean these days we uh, frankly the incidence of eclampsia has come down because of very strict vigilance i mean otherwise as you rightly said that with the season of monsoon every fresh shower there would be one eclamptic patient so in our prep personal practices our book patients don't turn up very rarely in fact uh, these days if we get it's more of a postpartum eclampsia and everything is fine just delivered and uh, she throws up a convulsion that is more common uh, we're seeing i think that is the only condition where eclampsia is managed and things go on smoothly and pregnancy continues that's it yes. i would i would put it that way that you can conserve those patients till the gestational age in which you can salvage that baby if you have a good nicu eclampsia yes. so delivery is the treatment for eclampsia you deliver the patient uh, put the uh, yes. do the nicu yes. treat for the baby so that would be the best thing which which we can do rather than keeping the baby inside and they be getting depressed so yes. the one more question dr sukumar devnath is asking i met few no, patients no, and keeping who are, the mother in danger also na Yes, continuing pregnancy is a continued threat to mother. Yes, now I met few uh, patients who were absolutely normal in prenatal screening, but suddenly they develop eclampsia, even though they were uh, absolutely normal transit throughout. So how to predict this eclampsia, Doctor Anjana Khanna, Madam? Do you, do you get such patients more in your practice, and how do you keep a track of this patient that this patient is going to go into eclampsia and this? patient probably may not actually you know so look at the family history see if she has a family history and she is that strung up pers personality she is uh, doing a job and she is very strung up then and she the borderline uh, blood pressure is on the higher side and then you see all the other parameters you take a family history then you just uh, tell her to go low on the salt and i always advise them to avoid extra salt like putting on salads and you know taking pickles which are very high in salt so if they can do this much also it somehow prevents and to just chill out a bit so it's very difficult if you have that sort of a mental makeup and another thing komal i wanted to point out in the previous question I know, I, that i think in a case of eclampsia uh, if the patient is not very stable then i would prefer to save the mother rather than look into the nation history yeah i would rather go in for the mother because uh, because maybe the second attack we may not be able to save the mother only so how will we save the fetus yeah. and how will we mature the fetus so i think both I things think, i think uh, pre eclampsia now can be predicted because of all the if we consider all the risk factors and the screening so now pre eclampsia can be predicted so we can give a uh, we can alter yes there is very good ratio we can have smflt and uh, placental growth factor ratio to But see eclampsia is not predicted if this patient but if it pt can be predicted if it is going to develop in 2 weeks the ratio is more than 38 then we yeah. can predict the pre eclampsia not eclampsia uh, but, but uh, we can predict if there is going to be yeah. that's what so there are many predictive markers but it is not uh, everybody is not having access to those markers those and people are, are not doing routinely there is even a simple test you know uh, which we can do a simple test is a blood test which shows if you are you, you are more prone a uh, normal pih will become a pre eclampsia pre eclampsia going to eclampsia so there is one simple spot test uh, i think the the sponsors bharat serum only are having it a lumela there is a new test which they do it and with that test you come to know if the patient is going into the higher form of pre eclampsia also the normal marker our uric acid is also considered to be a marker in which you can monitor with the uric acid and if the uric acid is on a rising trend those no, no. patients may land up into no, no, no. a serum uric acid is not now considered so no, there are some studies it there. can be added as a spectrum there are so many uh, markers which we have been see, using see, serum a rising serum uric acid is not an indication for termination yeah Although, not termination to know if the patient is going to has a high chance of developing a severe form of preeclampsia so we know, know to know if the patient is going to have a severe form uh, an, so another thing 
Dr. Komal, uh, what is very important is if we are going to be dealing with an early onset uh, preeclampsia or a late onset preeclampsia. So a preeclampsia which occurs in the uh, later part, uh, beyond 34 weeks, then we, are, we can anticipate better results. It's the early onset eclampsia which is more troublesome yes. because of the chances of fetal geopardy and maternal deterioration. So even when we are screening, it is to pick up those people who will get into early onset eclampsia. And uh, we used to give a lot of weightage to serum uric acid, but now what we give more weightage is to other things. Like if she has symptoms suggestive of severe PIH, that is headache, epigastric pain, enzymes, platelet counts, uh, um, SGOTPT and urea kidney function tests. So these things are more important, the scotomata symptoms. So all the complications of the And in, in today's scenario, what, uh, what I would say is besides all the tests and uh, which are available, we should not forget the clinical examination spectrum. Yes, of course. When patient is regularly coming to us, the same patient, we can definitely in her subsequent antenatal visits, we can see her, she's getting more toxic in terms of edema, puffiness, she's developing irritability at times. So those are the factors we should always look into mind. Such patients, they most of the time land up in eclampsia if we see in subsequent visits. Some of the other clinical problem is they're always there with them. So you require a whole patient monitoring this patient continuously keep him a watch on all the parameters of this patient yeah. apart from only in, uh, clinical as well as well, well as the uh, investigation. investigation so that is going and to actually help us uh, in knowing which I patients are going to have a severe form there is one samrakshan program started by idea it leads to it is uh, upgrading the skills of radiologist for second and third trimester color dopplers to predict the pt and it is running free in some of the hospitals at delhi also and that is very much effective in predicting the onset of a preeclampsia and patients with the uh, yeah basically IPS. see it is very very uh, the pathophysiology of preeclampsia is so clear that it is the uh, the vascular uh, invasion by the cytotrophoblast and two waves is not appropriate. So the, um, the blood circulation of the uteroplacental uh, bed, it is not a low pressure system anymore. So the first trimester uterine artery dopplers and the middle trimester uterine artery dopplers are extremely good predictors for what's going to come in the future. So I mean complete examination of the uh, patient as well as Relying on these two parameters, two times uterine artery dopplers have uh, assumed a lot of importance. They so advise the first trimester at 22 weeks and 32. They yeah. advise it three times. First yeah. trimester, yeah. first trimester uh, uh, uterine artery doppler will I actually identify those who are at risk of having a yes. problem. Yes. yes, and 22 yeah. weeks again. So we again are from so then and 32. If, even if it is normal at 22, we should do it at 32 weeks doppler studies. And, yeah. and the role of as yeah. the role so of as now we have one more question. This is uh, Dr. Kiran Chandana, madam. Uh, there is a question uh, that is there any role of NTG? Dr. Jotsna Poddar is asking role of NTG in management of hypertension in pregnancy. Have you ever yeah. used or you have read any studies about what? You can, you can unmute yourself. Anti what? Hello? NTG, nitroglycerin. NTG. Ah. NTG. Oh. NTG, nitroglycerin. NTG is used if it if the BP is not controlled by all other means, NTG can be used, but it is to be used in ICU setup so that the, with the help of physician or the study so that the, there is no uh, extra for uh, there is hypotension tension does not get we don't have the hypotension we can use it. I have used in my, uh, one of uh, one or two of my patients in uh, my nursing room. This was no, I have a drug that people used to use earlier. So she NTG. Can use NTG. But very well put that it should be used in an ICU setup. It Her be... husband is a very good physician, Dr. Komal. Uh, so she can use NTG. 
Not so easy. Okay. Yes. So it is a combined good. As obstetrician, we we would not be very convenient. Comfortable, yeah. Yeah, comfortable but, using but, anti but, definitely yes, with yes. in intensive care only we should use. So you require an ICU setup. You require to keep in good hands with with your fellow That's medical or intensivist. and you can use but i think uh, there are some patients who are on ntg drip yes. there are many questions regarding anti hypertensives and uh, one uh, dr sangeeta she is sharing her experience two patients recently managed with chronic hypertension both were delivered with survi prime and both babies died in utero at 28 and 30 weeks so very sad to hear in spite of so many anti hypertensives so people are sharing about uh, their things and uh, this is just a uh, thought which she has shared now i'm coming to a question what are the congenital anomalies with chronic hypertension so dr chanchal gupta you spoke upon chronic hypertension so yeah. what about the congenital anomalies so do these babies have congenital anomalies and do we have what do we have to keep in our mind the congenital anomalies per se because of chronic hypertension are not there but because of the drugs which are being used to control chronic hypertension congenital anomalies can be there so so uh, we have to keep in mind and uh, any uh, specific uh, uh, test or anything to be done regarding the congenital anomalies we just need to uh, scan for at the at level 1 that is the first trimester yes. screening from a fetal medicine specialist i would prefer in such patients because few anomalies though not related to the they are mostly picked up at the 18 weeks but still we can pick up few anomalies in first trimester scanning if done uh, done by a proper fetal medicine there could be actually uh, with this if there could be iugr there could be oligoamnios so maybe some limb deformities but not particularly with chronic hypertension but these are possibilities possible so we have one question not uh, from out of india so this is dr chong yok from south africa asking is uh, diffusing of essential oils advisable during pregnancy and is there any contraindications so i don't uh, know it is related to topic but there are a lot of essential oils which we use the uh, flavored one jasmine and soothing and everything anybody has any uh, idea about uh, any patients using and are there any contraindication whether you can use in pregnancy dr ranjana khanna madam for what purpose uh, essential oil it is generally in pregnancy is it contraindicated or no it's a no, question which, so <laughs> which which drug which drug any essential which drug oil are you talking about essential oils okay. like the flavored like uh, the fragrances or oils we have soothing oils uh, spa oils or what they go so are there any contraindications in pregnancy i don't think so there shouldn't be i think i most of a patient go for relaxation spa and everything yeah, yeah. Like, in case they want they can use the mustard oil and the coconut oil or the olive oil which will not have any problem but about the other unless we know the contents of that oil and anything that goes into the skin there is lot of if it can gets absorbed if the contents we don't know we cannot comment but yeah the usual oils that we use are quite safe i don't know about foreign so oil because, but because patients are little apprehensive so to allay anxiety we tell for relaxation yeah, purposes gentle massages with coconut use. or mustard oil are absolutely safe healthy lifestyle and exercise yes. so i don't think it would really harm So there is a question. Yeah. So there is a question repeatedly asked. The uh, audience want to know the magnesium sulfate dose in grams. So any, uh, I think uh, anybody, I think or Graham, Nishi Gupta want to uh, would just sum up the exact dose of magnesium sulfate. What we are using yeah, it. It is for the bolus dose. We use four to five milligram IV in fifteen to twenty minutes. Then. we can repeat the dose if it is intermittent then we should repeat it after 4 hours and im 10 mg that followed by 5 mg in alternate buttocks every 4 hour but in continuous iv regime we used to give it 
4 to 5 mg in 20 minutes of infusion and then we give IV infusion at the rate of 1 to 2 mg per hour to attain the desirable effect. But if there is recurrence of any convulsion, we can give a bonus of 2 mg, another 2 mg after 20 minutes of first dose. It is gram, no? It's gram. 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 4 to 5 grams. So the loading dose should contain the 4 gram IV as well as 10 yeah. gram IM which is given in both yeah. the and then yeah. every four hourly you will give five gram five in, every gram. Alternate, in alternate but according to picture and regime. And how long will you continue this for the? It should be not more than twenty four to forty eight hours, around twenty four hours because toxicity limit is also not much gap. So we have to keep in consideration the toxic effects. Although it is very neuroprotective to mother and fetal outcomes and most safest. It crosses the placental barrier, but the effects on uh, fetus are not that bad as compared to Dajipam and phenobarbitones. So it is preferred drug of choice. Yes. Uh, what I want to, uh, just I want to share my personal experience because I am of the same school as Dr. Nishi and all when we used to be using Lytic cocktail and we were only reading about Maxelf in our Williams textbook. But uh, personally, uh, because we are in standalone setups. So um, I don't know why, but I have actually never given IV loading. And for all my patients, intramuscular doses, four hourly, has worked wonders. So, I mean, even if patient comes convulsing or somebody who has a blood pressure which shoots up to 220, 120, and I give a uh, intramuscular loading dose and then repeat it four hourly, I am quite, uh, I mean, uh, satisfied, in fact. So I just wanted to ask that anybody else also has an experience of low-dose magnesium sulfate because personally, I have never given IV and I'm very, very comfortable. I've had very good me, results with IV. Believe me, the IV dose is quite safe. Patients yes. do tolerate. What is, what is the main thing is that the, uh, the IM dose which we give it, that is given as a prophylactic magnesium yeah. sulfate. In fact, with yeah. toxic medical disorders in pregnancy, I had done a survey also on the uh, World Preeclampsia Day. And there also we have the common practices what the obstetricians are following. So there is a role of prophylactic magnesium sulfate. Like you know the patient may be having some premonitory signs and you know that she is more prone to eclampsia. So in those cases where people, most of the people, they reported that they used the only the IM dose, not the loading dose. But when yeah. the patient is convulsing, I think the IV loading dose is very, very essential in such Yeah, patients. I mean, maybe because over the years, I've not had a, a patient. I, we get the patient who's already convulsed and reach. More time ho gaya ki koi convulsing nahi aaya. Maybe we are <laughs> dealing with healthier patients or what. So that is why maybe you can say now the incidence has decreased drastically. Yeah, yeah. But especially in our books in Ario, nobody yeah, is book to nahi seeing these book patients. Book. Although the incidence is still eight to ten percent of pregnancies, eclampsia is, but is very common, much there. Yeah, no, but and eclampsia in fact, has yes, reduced dramatically. Uh, now, and in fact, have, if you're worried, you can just send the serum magnesium levels also and monitor the patient. And yeah, you can know the there. first sign that you're monitoring your patellar reflex. If the level is little above normal, the first sign to go is your patellar reflex will become depressed. So at that point, you can just withheld that dose and just see if the patellar reflex are not suppressed and you can delay that next dose. It is not that advisable that you completely stop the magnesium therapy. But if it is not recurring or if it is the patellar, there is a loss of patellar reflex, then you will just keep the patient under monitoring. And in fact, at a very high dose, that is if the level become more than five millimoles, then the patient goes into respiratory depression and cardiac arrest at a very high dose. So we have that much window, you know, that to know that if the patient is getting depressed or patient is going into respiratory failure and we can always keep the calcium gluconate handy in our yeah. train. So which yeah. is the antidote and we can definitely reverse those signs. So with all those precautions and in that eclampsia tray, what we keep it, we keep the antidote, everything. It is really a safe dose and one should not hesitate giving magnesium sulfate because we have seen so many 
studies and even data in the clinical practice where been using judicious use of magnesium sulfate has saved so many patients at at time uh, uh, with this timely intervention so that is my experience and the experience with many people who have shared with me that is what i am telling yes so, now yes. i think we should have that inclination to use magnesium sulfate as and when required and uh, there are a lot lot many with that note we have lot many uh, messages coming let like excellent uh, discussion and somebody complimented the essential oil question also so i think people are hearing very attentively this was dr prasanna so i think uh, rest all we have covered same things are asked about magnesium sulfate so uh, with that note i think we have almost it is going to be got to 8 we had a real lot of discussion and uh, great uh, uh, take home messages from everybody but now before we end i want to show you one image i hope it is opening i want to just share my screen let me just check and i i really want to thank uh, everybody who has participated today all the panelists dr anjana khanna madam all the society the faridabad rohtak rewari ambala all the societies who have really done a fantastic we have reached all the corners of india we plan to have more and more webinars in future and with this note i mean i want to thank you with this note and you will uh, we will say the following the day is day out either webinar so other webinar but then a lot of people have told me that the best thing that happened to india was we learned how to use our time to update ourselves in this lockdown period and believe me these educational webinars have been mind blowing we have been only adding to the quality of discussion of this webinar and making our benchmark and at that i remember something and i will end with that that this is only done for you for all of you and we have to bridge the gap all over india and we have to keep conducting webinar discuss the common topic so be it monday be it thursday or tuesday the every day is the best day to have a webinar So thank you very much. Thank you all, thank you, 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 This is the time all of us are becoming highly educated obstetricians <laughs> and gynecologists. Thank you so yeah, much. We had almost more than five hundred people. Uh, oh. Just it has come in my chat, and these are all over, even from Korea. So I think we have become international. So that is a good note. And uh, thank you. Congratulations so to you for a good oh, moderation. All the panelists have really contributed very well. I thank hope you. session we are off. Off on air, na? Session is not come. Madam, we are still live. We are still live. <laughs> thank so, you, the audience. We should thank the audience. So thank you, audience, so, for the record down, number. With the small society, also we are having audience of more than five hundred. So it is really very commendable, and that is only because of the efforts of our eminent speakers and panelists. and uh, we have uh, today made with the proxy medical disorders in pregnancy committee this webinar